Well, greetings, friends. Can we uh, thank these guys for leading us in worship so well, so sweet. And can we go ahead and thank God for the weather while we're at it? Man, gosh, finally, there is a God in heaven, all's right with the world. Lord, it's been a haul. Anyway, it's great to see you. If I don't know, if I don't have the chance to know you yet, I hope I get to meet you. My name is Will Davis, Jr., Welcome to Austin Christian Fellowship. We're really thrilled to have you here. You guys online, we love you. We're glad you're part of this as well. Thanks for being a part, and feel free to show up in person. If there's something that happens, um, I met a guy in the hall last week, first time a tender, and he said, you know, I got to come back because, and this is before the service started. We may have chased him off during the service, but before the service started, he said, um, I got to come back. He said, this is the most loving I've ever felt walking into a church, most loved I've ever felt. And he said, actually, no. He said, I felt that I drove on the property. And he said, one of your greeters, the way they greeted me on the parking lot patrol, like I've not been, so anyway, um, there's something here. No, there's someone right. here. So feel free to join us. If you need a Bible, would you please raise your hand? We'd love to give you a Bible and, and um, you can keep it if you want. Don't be shy. I need you to find John the 17th chapter. Um, if you need a copy of scripture, feel free to take one. Take your copies, please, and turn to John 17. And also, the, from the chapter we just sang out of, Psalm 119. I'll be there in just a minute. Uh, thank you. There's, we got one right over here, Amy girl. Yeah, okay, never mind. We got it. Okay, you're good. Um, let me pray. Lord, I want to thank you for the eclipse yesterday. That was cool. It was beautiful. The this, this shadows just killed me, Lord. Your handiwork. Um, I want to thank you for provision for the ministries in Guatemala who have been um, shut down or unable to get food for the orphans because the country is in crisis. And I thank you that there's a brief window and food's getting in. I pray you protect them. And Lord, I pray you'd heal the land in Israel. Um, it's hard to watch. And that's, those are our ancestors. We wouldn't, have, we wouldn't be here today but for Israel. And so um, we know we owe our spiritual heritage to them. And we pray for peace there, Lord, in Jerusalem, in that state. Pray for peace in Austin, Texas, and healing in Austin, Texas, and favor in Austin, Texas, and in the homes and neighborhoods and schools and communities around here, Lord, that we get to serve. And Lord, now make us holy. You started it, we pray you continue it in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're, in, we're over halfway through, crazy. A series called Sacred, where we're talking about this call to be holy. And you guys have been amazing um, during this series. I, I love the context, the comments I'm getting from you guys and what I'm hearing about what's going on in your small groups and your lives personally. And we're gonna continue it for three more weeks. So thanks for sticking around and being a part. Um, today I wanna talk about how God works to make us holy. Next week I'm gonna talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in being holy. You would think the Holy Spirit has something to do with that. So in John 17, it is an amazing chapter. It's the longest prayer recorded in the Bible. And it's the prayer of Jesus somewhere in Gethsemane before maybe he has that, Lord, take this cup from me moment. He's given his final instructions to his disciples. And he's now praying in their presence for them to get and understand um, what he's asking. In John 17, verse 15, talking to his father about his disciples and about us, he says, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. 
Verse 17, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. So I love that phrase. That's where I want to dwell just for a moment with you guys this morning. Sanctify them. That's, again, the process of being made holy. God, when you become a Christian, declares you holy and says you're, you're going to be holy and I'm going to make you holy and you're going to spend eternity being holy. Yay. Sanctification is the process. And it, if anybody thinks sanctification is fun, you're not in it yet. It's, it's a process. And it, it's the school of hard knocks and it's ups and downs and it's sometimes discipline for sin. But it's something. <laughs> it's something. So... I think it's real, this text to me, John 17, notice in my Bible, it's all red. I mean, that's holy ground. This is Jesus praying. I don't think you get any holier than that. And I want you to, there's a lot here, but I want you to let me point out to you what Jesus says about us, about you. So he asserts, number one, this is not about you, but it's still true, he asserts, number one, that evil is real. I don't think I have to make a case for that. Not just evil, but the evil one. Evil does not happen in a vacuum. Evil comes from the evil one. People under the influence of the evil one do evil things. Evil's real. He says, um, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. That's the prayer that we not listen to his lies, believe what he says, and become participants in his dark kingdom. So, first of all, Jesus asserts in his prayer, evil's real. Secondly, he asserts that he's not going to take us out of the world yet. Because if he did, there'd be a vacuum. There'd be no salt and no light. So, he's not going to take us out of the world, but he intends to distinguish us from it. Now, this is what we've been hit, hitting on this entire series. And this is what's been so challenging to me in looking at my own life, is how much do we blend in, do we mix, and how much do we look distinct from everything going on around us? And he says, my plan is, I'm not taking them out, because if I do, then evil's going to win the day. I've got to leave them in the world. I've got to leave the church in the world. But I want you to keep them distinct from it. So he says, they're not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. They're in it, but they're not of it. That's an important tension, in but not of. You might just want to write that down, in but not of. I'm going to be in the middle of all the mess, but I'm not supposed to look like it. I'm not supposed to contribute to it. And I'm not supposed to participate in it. I'm going to look different. And finally, his plan for keeping us in the world and yet protecting us from it is our sanctification. And his strategy for our sanctification, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, what we just sang. David wrote that a thousand years before Jesus. His plan is his word. Not hard. So there is, as you guys know, a direct relationship between sanctification, which is being made holy, big 75 cent word for just being made holy, and the scriptures. That's the best record of the word we have today is the scriptures. So if sanctification is something you're interested in, being in the world but not of it, being able to resist temptation, to look different, to have a life that is free from the constant guilt and shame of giving in all the time, if you want to be above that and free from that, you've got to have a relationship, which we'll talk about, with the Word of God. Now I want you to notice that Jesus said, I need you to think just for a minute. It's early, but I need you to think for a minute. Jesus said, sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. Who's, not what is the word, who is the word? Not rhetorical, you can answer it. You know, Jesus. 
John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was logos, the Word. The Word became flesh, verse 14. The Word is not just something written down. The Word is a person. Jesus identified as the Word, the logos, the big concept of God. So let me give you, so let me put this on screen. What does Jesus mean by truth when he says your word is truth? And let me just give you my little two-word definition. Let's call it spiritual absolutes. We're in this crazy world today that says everything is relative. You can define your own reality. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. When I see, I'm, I have a very ungodly moment. When I see a bumper sticker that says define your reality, I want to run my car into them and say, hey, welcome to my reality. You're stupid. I know it's not godly, but it's what, I mean, I'm, I'm sanctification's going on here too, or maybe not. Oh, Lord. <laughs> there are spiritual, ab, there, are, there are things that you don't negotiate with. Gravity is a big one. The laws of physics tend to work. Well, there's spirit, there, and what's, what's interesting is all the physical realities are nothing more than reflections of spiritual ones. They're even bigger. So when Jesus says, your word is truth, sanctify them in truth, sanctify them in those non-bending spiritual realities that set people free. The more you know them, the freer you are. People that are enslaved may live, they, they want to live outside the word of God. They're not really free. They're enslaved to sin and Satan and death and all the junk with it. People that understand there are spiritual absolutes, and when you flow with the absolutes, you have freedom, they get what life's about. The only way to know what spiritual absolutes are and are not is to know the Word personally by a relationship with Him and by what He says. Friends, all the chaos going on with our teenagers today, with parents in crisis, the mental health crisis that's just assaulting people, is directly related to a complete either rejection of or lack of awareness of spiritual realities, spiritual absolutes. There are just some things you don't argue with. God and his world are one of them. Now, one more little bit of a cerebral, I need you to think for a minute. Sanctify them in the truth. Okay, can you think grammar with me for a minute? That little preposition, in. I may, I may just geek out on you here, so just bear with me. It's not sanctify them by the truth, which would be a tool, or sanctify them with the truth, which would be a means, a tool. It's a spherical influence. Sanctify them to the degree that they're in the sphere of truth. They'll be sanctified. Now, it's true that the word is a tool. And it's true that the word is a means. But that's not what Jesus is saying. Whew. I don't want you to miss it. He's saying that there is a realm called truth that you choose to live in or choose to live out of. It's a place, it's a, it's a reality, truth. And it, it begins and ends with a five letter name, J-E-S-U-S. -S. Like back in the day when most of you were not born, there were things on street corners called phone booths. You could actually go in the phone booth and close the door behind you because you would want people to hear your call. They were the trashiest things on the planet. Every, nothing good ever happened in a phone booth, except Superman changed clothes there. If I see the phone booth and the phone's ringing, I got to make a decision to get in the phone booth. It's like, oh, the phone's ringing and I want to go, I got to be in there to answer the phone. So I've got to take the appropriate steps to be in the realm that is defined by there's, a, there's outside and there's inside. Can't answer the phone from the outside. I've got to get in the booth. So I've got to take the appropriate steps to get in where that is. 
Well, that's what Jesus is talking about here. Friends, this is not, this is not passive. This is not um, wait and see. Lord, sanctify them in the realm of truth. Your word, make, help my disciples to understand there's real and there's true and there's evil and there's false. There's death. And help them to live the kind of lives, again, I encourage you to read Psalm 1, the first three verses, to live the kind of lives that understand what truth is and make strategic decisions to be in truth. To be def- marked by truth. It's just, it's just so strong. And remember, this is what Jesus is praying right before he dies. This isn't light stuff. Lord, make them holy in the realm of your truth. To the degree that they exist in the realm of what is real and not what is not real, they're going to be holy. So I'm not just praying that they, they read truth. I'm praying that they exist in truth, that it define who they are. Friends, welcome to biblical Christianity. Not 21st century Christianity where it's like casual and you stick your toe in the water, you call if there's a 911. No, it defines you. It is, it's like Deuteronomy chapter, the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, where everything, it's on your doorpost and it's on your forehead and it's, in, it's all around you. The truth is all around you. And you don't step outside of it because that step, when you step outside of it, there's evil and you're exposed. We have a generation of young men and women going to colleges and high schools and workplaces and ACL completely unprotected by truth. Talk about secondhand smoke. I've never been to ACL. My daughter came back one time and was like, what is that smell? Well, a lot of us have the secondhand smoke of darkness and evil on us because we're not, we're not in the truth of God's word. So here's an invitation. Here's a baptism slide. We're going to baptize in about two weeks, three weeks, first week in November, whenever that is. Take a picture of this if you need to. There are some of you that need to go public. You guys online? Or you need to... to cross the line of seeking to following and the first the first non-delayed step of obedience of that is baptism baptism symbolizes your immersion in the realm of truth i'm not walking the path of culture or evil anymore i'm walking in the path of jesus And I invite you to participate in that coming up in a few weeks. Sign up. Okay, let's go to Psalm 119. If you're not aware of Psalm 119, it's my favorite chapter probably in the Bible. It says a lot because there's bunches of chapters in the Bible, and I like a lot of them. We're going to read 9 through 11. It's the longest chapter in Scripture it's liter- a literary piece of genius work. I won't explain it to you right now, but it's, li- it's a literary masterpiece. Just what happens grammatically in this psalm is so inspiring. But it's curious to me that the topic of the longest chapter in the Word of God is the Word of God. It's about the Word of God. And we just sang, I think it's Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word, O Lord, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And as a guy who spent a lot of time in somewhat treacherous places before dawn, a, l- a lamp to your feet is a big deal. When you're David and you're a shepherd and you're out poking around, you need a lamp to your feet. Your word, God, is my lamp. In this dark world, your word is my lamp. What is lighting your path today? Psalm 119 verse 9 says, listen, I've got this and not in this Bible, but I've got multiple Bibles, my initials and my son-in-law's, both of them initials, and my son's initials. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to your word. Isn't that great? I pray that for my son's-in-law and my son, and now my grandsons. 
which are, by the way, like a locust plague when they come to visit. <laughs> they came the other day, and it's like Joel chapter 1. They came and left nothing. They just blew through. There's just debris everywhere. It's a locust. It's a locust. It's very much like a locust plague. And there's more coming. Verse 10, with all my heart I've sought you. Do not let me wander from your commands. When was the last time you prayed that? Look at, look at 11. Your word I've treasured in my heart so I won't sin against you. I could have picked, there's 176 verses in this psalm. I could have picked about 170 of them to show you. So let's talk about navigation. So let me show you some pictures this, I, I did a, hang on a sec, I did a mountain at the end of August called Kit Carson. Um, it's one of the 14ers, 14,000 foot mountains in Colorado, and there's a ridge on it called Challenger Point, which is above 14, which is named in honor of the Challenger crew after they died on January 28th, 86. And so you walk along, there's this plaque. So Kit Carson's a beast of a mountain, 6,000 feet of vertical gain, which is 600 stories, it's over a mile vertically. So it's a big day. I did it, in, it took me 24 hours. I camped on the mountain. So the second morning was the day the remnants of Hurricane Hillary were coming in from the West Coast, and Colorado got hit by some of those remnants. I'm hiking that morning. So this is my sunrise, and you can see the, the clouds are hanging really low. And usually it's, you know, this is 6.30 in the morning, so it's really, and I've been hiking two hours at that point. It's usually really clear. So I know I got some weather issues. So I get to the ridge, look at this next picture. I get to the ridge, and this is what I'm dealing with. Well, that's not happy. I've never been there before. And as you can imagine, that ridge, there's nothing on the other side. So I'm walking on this side of the ridge, but... I've got to walk along that ridge because the summit where I'm going is an hour in front of me that way. And it was like the waves of the clouds were coming up against that ridge like, like waves. Can't see anything. So I get a little further. This is the this summit block of Kit Carson. Next slide. There's Kit Carson. And what you do is you go through that where the cloud is and you turn right. You see that big black gap in the mountain going this way? That's called the avenue. You go up the avenue and around, and I'm about an hour from the summit right there. Because you go all the way around the summit block. Now, before I show you the next slide, navigation going up gets easier because the mountain gets narrower and you run out of options. Navigation coming down is crazy because you've got everything opens up in front of you. And there was a point I had to drop over that ridge that was vertical and go around to get to where I was going. And again, I've, I've talked to you before, if you make a, a bad move coming down something like this, you can get in real trouble. So this next one is just for fun. I got to the summit. Look at this picture. That's my shadow on the cloud. It's the second time it's happened to me on a mountain. You get up and the clouds are below you. You go, oh, that's me on the cloud. So I took a picture um, in case they'd never find me, they understand why. That's why right there. <laughs> if, they show, if the snow melts in April and you find me, that's why, okay? Isn't that cool? That's what you see. That's why you climb mountains right there. I saw myself in a cloud. So I want to talk to you about navigation. in very treacherous, treacherous terrain. Because you're going to work and you're going to school and you're going to soccer games and you're going to family reunions and you're going on vacation and you're going to weddings and all this stuff in a hostile world that is very difficult to navigate. And David wrote the longest chapter in the Bible about the importance of having good navigation skills. And he linked those navigation skills to the Word of God. I, forgive me, I just want to come out there and shake some of you and say, what are you thinking? How do you dare walk into a world without Scripture? 
excuse me, you're the problem. You're the one blogging and Facebooking and tweeting and Instagramming about how we're supposed to embrace culture. And we're not. So would you please get offline and quit communicating all your gibberish into the world about how good culture is when the Word of God says it's evil. And would you please fill your mind with, would you, get in the, would you go in the phone booth and close the door and just stay a while? Because you're doing more damage than you are good by spewing the junk of culture. Now, if, don't get mad at me. Read it here. You got an issue with what I'm saying? Bring it to this. Let's go. I'll sit down with you over coffee. We'll talk about this. Not about Instagram. Not about what the Wall Street Journal is saying or the Rolling Stone. Or you pick your, What's this saying? I'm just, I want to shake some Christians and say, what are you thinking? You just jumped into bed with darkness, and that never ends it well. So get offline until you understand what truth is. Sorry. Don't encourage it. It will only get worse. Don't ever, never say preach it to a preacher. You don't want to say that. Okay. We're mapping God's truth. Number one, remember. We're finding our way in the culture through to remember. Remember what Jesus said in his prayer. Remember, evil's real. Friends, evil's real. Say it out loud. Evil is real. It's real. It's terrifying. Secondly, God's not going to take you out of the world, but he's going to distinguish you from it. Third, remember that his plan is your sanctification and his strategy is his word. Remember. Fourth, remember that sanctification happens in the realm of truth. Get in the phone booth. And close the door. Make the decisions to be in truth. That means you date people who are in truth, you work with people who are in truth. If you can't and don't, you can date, you can make choices. If you can't, when you're working, you can't make choices, but you can not let who they are change who you are. That's supposed to go the other direction. Be with them, love on them, but be truth. Secondly, you ready? This, this right here is the moment of truth. Surrender to the authority of God's word and don't negotiate with it. When Santa Ana had a brief encounter with the Alamo before the fight on March the 6th, they sent out emissaries and he said, Here's the, here are the terms, unconditional surrender. I'll tell you then what's going to happen. We're not here to negotiate. You just surrender. That's a negative example. This is the greatest source of life on the planet. It's really the only source of life on the planet. You don't negotiate with the life giver. So I'm asking you today to make an un conditional surrender to the authority of God's word in your life. Somebody's got to decide who's in charge here. You need a buck stops here source. And this is it. Jesus said, sanctify them in the realm of your truth. If you want to negotiate with the word of God, friends, then you're going to be subject to all kinds of nasty spiritual shenanigans. Don't, don't negotiate, just surrender. You guys online, yield to the word of God. Don't pick what you're going to say yes and no to. Just say yes. I'm not saying it's easy, but I'm saying it sets you free. John 8, 31, truth sets free. Finally, move in. I mean, have a moment. 
where you say, I want the walls around me to be truth. And that means that you, it's real practical. It's a little ethereal way I'm describing it, but you're going to let people who are of the truth speak into you. You're going to renew your mind on a regular basis with the scriptures that are truth. And you're going to hide God's word in your heart so his word can be a lamp to your feet. So when you're navigating darkness out there, something is showing you what's real and what isn't. And you're going to close the door behind you. This, this feels like the end of the series. It may just be the end of me, but it feels like the end of the series. <laughs> Where I really am feeling the urge to just plead with you and call you to get off the fence spiritually. Quit trying to live in two worlds. You would think the pull of light would be so great you could live in two worlds and pull darkness into light. Jesus said you could nullify the word of God with your tradition, and the traditions are good. So think what evil does to you. You can't live in two worlds. And, and when you're missionary dating or you're missionary, what you're trying to you know, be in darkness and kind of dabble, you're compromising to be a bridge. I've been talking to you guys about it. We have a bridge. It's Jesus. You don't need to be a bridge. Don't compromise. When you compromise, you inevitably jettison truth. It's not that truth wins when you compromise. It's truth ultimately gets jettisoned, and you become sitting with scoffers, Psalm 1. So you gotta, the only way to stay pure is to not compromise. So I'm asking for maybe I'm 300 people in this altar in a minute repenting of compromise if, we have to, if that's what it takes because you cannot compromise and be pure. Sanctify them in, your, in the realm of truth. There's no compromise in the realm of truth. I asked you a few weeks ago, Jesus gave his life for your holiness. What are you willing to give? Okay, here's the prayer. You, Megan, you want to come on up, sunshine? Isn't Megan Abraham amazing? This is the most amazing human on the planet. She's so godly and so gifted, sings with so much joy. Let me read you the prayer. It's on the screen. Feel free to take a picture of it. It's a prayer with Jesus for our sanctification. Let me, I'll read it a line at a time. And you guys just pray along as you need to. Whew. Holy Father, we acknowledge what you've told us. That evil is in the world. We also acknowledge that while you leave us in the world, you expect us to be distinct and set apart from it. You expect us to be distinct. Father, we agree with the prayer of Jesus. Sanctify us in your truth. Let's make that first person. Lord, sanctify me in your truth. In the name of Jesus, we surrender. I surrender to the authority of your word. Whew. There's a non unnegotiable, non negotiable surrender. I will not negotiate with it. We commit today in Jesus' name to live in the realm of your truth. And Father, as we saturate our lives 
our hearts and our minds with your truth. The word is sanctify us. Let me change it. Make, make us holy. Make us holy. Set us apart to you and for you. And before I say the last line, we have an entire division of ministry here, our adult discipleship ministry, and students and youth and children do the same thing, committed to helping you saturate your mind with truth. That's what we do is we teach you how to get in the Bible. If you don't know how to do that, contact our group's ministry this week and let them talk to you about here are the steps you can take to saturate yourself. It's just not that hard, but it requires some proactivity on your part. And we pray this, Lord. You guys agree? In Jesus' name. Whew. You guys online, we love you. We'd love to see you. We'll see you next week.